And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, families and, <laughs> and most batshit ways possible. Jeez, I'm screwing up my own intro. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. One half of the double-headed monster that is Backwards Tabletop, the madman behind uh, the, the southern gothic horror that is Backwater, and then expanding it with City of the Arch, and now expanding it even further with the into the Backwards Double Feature through Back Channels and Backwoods, which we'll be getting to tonight. The one and only Asa Olsen. How you doing today, man? Thanks again for having me. Thank you for coming on, and thank you for having some of the having some of the easier time zones that I've had to work with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, it's always nice when time zones match up, but uh, yeah, constantly always <laughs> interviews, actual plays, and everything. Trying to get all those juggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. There's obviously been a f there's obviously been a few ch a few changes. There's been a a shift that I've no that I've noticed of ba of backwards being being more of a more of a more of a broad scope concept rather than just southern gothic. Uh, was that was that something that you get, that you guys had in had intended from the get go, or was it something that just happened as things developed? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's a really great question, and somebody was just asking me this the other day. So I, I guess I'll, zo I'll zoom out a little bit, but yeah, as you mentioned, you know, we started with backwater, and then, and as you've just said too, we've sort of expanded out the, uh, out a bit. So backwater, you know, was set in New Orleans. It's a Southern Gothic horror game set in post-apocalyptic New Orleans in particular. And when we First, went to write that game. Uh, we weren't necessarily thinking about creating a series based on it. I think you, you know, you, the thoughts might have crossed our mind and all that. But that was like our very first Kickstarter, our very first game, and we were just one of the things we're trying to do is create something new and fun, uh, in in a very original setting with a sort of an appealing system. That was sort of our main focus. And I was living in Arkansas at the time. Which uh, which was part of that, um, and uh, so our focus for that one was really thinking, okay, use this genre which we felt was really underexplored, Southern Gothic, uh, and how can we bring that to a tabletop game? How can we communicate that here in the in this setting, and then within our system uh, too, and then from there, uh, I think after we funded backwater we were pretty excited about it. we were thinking oh maybe we could get another game out of this and uh, and alex had some ideas right away for for the second game but we actually had somebody reach out to us and say hey would you be interested in starting a discord so we chat with other people about this and in particular about the universe and sure and we set up a discord and we we're sort of surprised by how many people signed up pretty early on because there many of them were interested in exploring or imagining the setting in other regions. And that sort of fit some of the ideas that Alex and I had, but really hadn't uh, set out uh, to do anything with, which is, well, Southern Gothic is a type of uh, American Gothic, a regional Gothic. So when we think about American Gothic, it's taking the Gothic tradition, putting it in an American setting. And there's a lot of regional American Gothics, but Southern Gothic being probably the most established one, there's sort of a New England Gothic too, or a small town Gothic, uh, which the stuff we played on in Backroads. Um, so I would say it was never our intention, but we sort of expanded uh, outwards uh, from Southern Gothic into thinking about different regional American Gothics and trying to find ways to bring those settings uh, to life in our newer game. Mm -hmm. The newest ones, as you mentioned, are back channels and backwoods. The back channels takes us over to Florida, Georgia, and Alabama. Um, and then backwoods uh, takes us over to New England, but uh, the Northeast uh, more broadly as well. Yeah. 
And I think the I think the I, I suppose the big the big thing to ask next would be um, what prompt what prompted you to go with these two regions for the for this current project? Mm -hmm. So uh, you know our second so our first region we said it was uh, New Orleans in the mm -hmm. deep south. Uh, and part of that was because I was living in that area. And the second one was uh, St. Louis, but Middle America, which is sort of where Alex and I are both uh, originally originally from, or at least from, from the Midwest there. Um, and then for these two settings, there are a couple of things that inspired it. For Backwoods, which is set in New England, well, Alex, right around the time we started making these games, as I moved to Arkansas, Alex actually moved over to New England. And... And was living in New England. He's been there for uh, for a few uh, for a few years now too. But I think that was one of the main inspiration uh, uh, for him, really wanting to bring that setting to life. But also a lot of folks who have inspired us, or when we think of sort of powerhouses in American Gothic fiction tradition, many of them are from New England. Mm -hmm. And uh, whether or not they're modern authors or or older, but you know Stephen King, uh, Shirley Jackson the biggest names over there, but it could also be Edgar Allan Poe. It could be Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, you know, Washington Irving. And so those are some of our main inspirations and some of the fiction that's inspired us. Like I've, I've taken different Edgar Allan Poe uh, fiction and, uh, and Washington Irving fiction, and we've sort of worked them into bits of pretty much all of our settings. Think about American Gothic. So those have always been inspiration. I think uh, part of the reason we prioritized it is after living there for a few years, Alex really wanted to take on that backwoods setting and had a lot of great ideas. And then back channels was a little bit different. That was one where uh, as we were imagining this world, we we're also sort of thinking about it in of, of genres that uh, that could come up or types of stories uh, associated with, with these different regions. And nautical romance and piracy these are very popular and, and common themes but uh in uh in the southeast uh, of the u.s there's a really uh you know a deep uh, tradition and history uh, especially history around piracy in that area whether low country piracy or piracy within the gulf so uh so we wanted to explore some of some of that fiction uh, and treasure hunting like that uh, within one of our settings. And I think that was one of the more uh, inspired things that, uh, that we had felt when we were originally imagining the setting. But even nowadays, we see we see plenty of that on TV. And I think one of the most popular modern examples, um, it, it, you know, that Netflix production, um, Outer Banks, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, begins to explore some of the those very themes, especially around treasure hunting. So we're we're picking up on uh, on some of those, and those are the two newest settings that inspired us because uh, of Alex literally living in one of those areas, and then our exploration of of the genre fiction for the other. Oh yeah, and with the, I believe that there was one other, there was one other story there was one other story that I remember I remember seeing that. Fell with that fell within that particular archetype. Um, just for whatever reason, the na the name isn't. Com it'll prob it'll probably end it'll probably end up coming to me at the wor at the worst ra random t random time. <laughs> yeah. But well, there, there are terms, and we do draw from different types of fiction. You know, as as you're thinking about that, or different. Uh, different stories uh and and some are, are not american gothic admittedly but you know treasure island in, in particular uh british author even um still a pretty big inspiration quite a lot of modern uh, uh around or that's been told or retold around that area or fascinations with with the with the americas or transatlantic fiction uh Southeast, but uh, Washington Irving even has some tales, uh, um, and 
we sort of took one of those in Devil and Tom Walker sort of uh, uh, talks about piracy, although it's a, in a New England setting. Um, but we work in some of some of that mythos in there too, mm-hmm. and yeah, and and it's not limited to the to the southeast either. You know, when you think about American fo- uh, folklore, I think I don't remember his name. I think it's like Old Stormalong. Is that? Um, yeah, I think it's Captain Stormalong. Uh, he was more of a New England uh, folk tale, but again, sort of this nautical legend along the lines of Pecos Bill or Paul Bunyan. And we try to work in some of that uh, into the into the broader setting or context. Mm-hmm. Action. So with and I do I do remember for whatever reason I was thinking of season one True Detective, which is oh yeah in it which is an interesting in particular, beat. We some- mm-hmm. um, and I sub. I suppose, I, I suppose if I, I suppose if I wanted to go with something a little bit easier, I could I could bring up Swamp Thing, if especially Thank since you. that live act that live action take on Swamp Thing from a few years ago was largely filmed in Georgia because I've been noticing a lot more productions um, filming filming in there. Maybe maybe it's maybe it's a a um, a tax credit de- a tax credit deal. Um, yeah. it's just, it's just something that I've no, that I've noticed. Yeah, well, I'd say yeah. I didn't see the new live action Swamp Thing. I think it was on the CW. But I do love. I have a collection of the um, of the Swamp Thing uh, uh, comics sitting over on my on my uh, bookshelf uh, mm-hmm. right now. And those are an inspiration, uh, especially for Backwater and and even some of the monsters we created for it, like. Swamp fiend, as we as we called it, uh, definitely sort of based on this on the swamp thing. But we had a back channels actual play uh, probably two months ago or a month ago, which features a swamp fiend and brings that into the setting too. But the other, uh, and there are a couple other graphic no- novels that inform it too. Alex and I, I mean, we, we love to read, and we we read a lot of similar materials and get talking. Mm-hmm. Carroll County is actually. A series of graphic novel that Alex got me started on, um, set set more in the in the southeast. So it's a different uh, vein of Southern Gothic uh, uh, horror and fiction. Maybe you know Flannery O'Connor is more of the Georgia area and whatnot, and ha- and Harrow County sort of uh, fills in part of that gap too. But we're really inspired by Harrow County mm-hmm. monster where it come from. Characters. Yeah. Uh, within Harrow County too, uh, which which come from a greater folklore within mm-hmm. the South. Yeah, so we love love to bring different types of fiction into um, into the setting and a lot of those creations. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I suppose one of the big things that I I couldn't help but notice is um codif- is codifying the name of you, of your mechanics as the Backbone System and putting in a SRD license. Um, mm-hmm. This this might be a bit obvious, but was was that kind of thing done done in response to the um, insanity that happened back in January? Oh, well, actually, we had it uh, before that uh, even. So, um, yeah, but uh, that was I think we probably on our uh, SRDs a little bit or updated them following the. Uh, the open game license fiasco of uh, of earlier this year. Mm-hmm. But yeah, when we released Backwater, we actually released it with an SRD, and part of that was the hopes, you know, hey, maybe somebody wants to, to do something with the game system. Uh, and then we really did expand on it at, at some point in time, around the time that we were working on Backroads, I think. And we did on our Itch uh, page, you'll find... We have a, a something called ba- uh, backwater brew, which is basically some things that folks can use for home brewing uh, with our game. So they can create stat blocks for monsters. We give them some graph, uh, some graphics or a template that they can just fill in, as well as some of the the graphic assets that we use uh, for uh, for backwater too. Mm-hmm. Uh, we still have to build that out more for backroads and back channels and backwoods too, uh, but. 
uh, some of that backwater brew material, we actually had a few folks um, in our Discord, or and one of them might have been on Twitter, to ask about it so that they could pull together material for their games and share them with characters and or put them on uh, put them online. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we we were always sort of open to it. I think one of the things that we have found or that we believe is games are better when and folks can create things with them and not have to worry about all these restrictions and stuff. And and we aren't so worried about, you know, being really rigid or somebody stealing our game or, you know, our mechanics or anything like that. Uh, we don't really see that so much as an issue, but rather just another form of, uh, of engagement uh, with our game. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and sometimes folks, you know, we, we have mixed, some folks really love our setting. Some folks really love our system. Some love both. And we, uh, a mix of uh, of those types of comments, but I think for a lot of people, when they're considering buying a Kickstarter, they're going, oh, I have to learn an entire new system for uh, for this. And we do include all the systems. Our our books are standalone, so all the system information is. Uh, we discussed this with you last time when we were talking about backroads too. But uh, so all that stuff is in there. Uh, but folks have asked, okay, do I have to learn this entire new system? What if I just want to adapt the, the setting? And uh, we are very beholden to our setting. We're very beholden to our system. We create it that way because we think it works. But at the same time, if you feel like that there's that they, if there's already a system that you want to use, you just want to adapt our setting for uh, for it. You know, go for it. It's more we just want people to have fun with mm-hmm. our game. Uh, and to and to enjoy it, and if that includes homebrewing, if that includes adapting or creating your own setting or you too, uh, we encourage whatever you need. To funnel. Yeah. Now, the, obviously, the, obviously, there's um, there's a new with this with both of these. There's um, new sets of archetypes, and and since archetype is one of the one of the big one of the big pillars within the character creation setup i fi- i figured this would be a good as good a time as any to delve into the archetypes in um ba- in um back channels and backwoods so i'd like so i'd like to i'll start i'll start with back channels and then and then i'll and then i'll dip into backwoods um just kind of getting a feel for what sort what sort of playstyle each ar- each archetype would represent and obviously i'm going with the ones in the in the quick start starting yeah. with the smuggler yeah yeah so again we're we're building up on some of the nautical romance uh uh themes while we're doing that we're also trying to make sure that these that these archetypes are not only good in certain situation like i think i think that can be an issue uh, where if you have a, a settings that that have like for us our, our games can have very different scopes we want people to be able to pick up some of these archetypes and use them in a different game if they want. Mm-hmm. for example we had a there's a backwoods actual play where three of the characters were from or from the backwoods start it'll be our backwoods core rule book or core book and then one of the players wanted to do something from uh, from backroads, Lewis, uh, and because uh, they want to do some cool things, technology, which is a big part of that. And we love that they're able to sort of plug and play, and we want that to happen with our archetypes for the new games too. So one of the challenges with that in back channels is like, yeah, we want to make sure they can do cool stuff when they're like, say, on a ship and at sea, and we want because that's something we want to be part of this game. A sort of sea travel, uh, a different form of travel adventure. But we want to make sure that the character archetypes aren't going to be moved into that position either. So you asked about the the smuggler, and one of the things that the smuggler is good with is vehicles. Uh, uh, so, and beyond vehicles, being able to carry a lot of stuff and use or exchange items, and there will be more of this expanded uh, as we. Uh, Beyond the quick start, which only is two of their abilities here. Uh, mm-hmm. But basically, uh, the smuggler uh, can carry extra materials uh, easily and can also swap them with other characters 
uh, whether or not in combat or what have you. So that can be sort of a really handy feature uh, when you when you really need it. But item slots are a way, are, are sort of one of the survival horror mechanics, a resource, and the smuggler can help people with that resource man. That's one of the pieces. And then, like I said, they're also really good at uh, with vehicles and things. And that could be a ship, but it could also be carts. And again, it's not limited to just the setting where it ends up useful. And then beyond that, being able to hide and conceal things on their person or on these vehicles be another sort of core comp uh, component or two. Uh, the smuggler meant to uh, play into that nautical romance scene, but also be flexible enough for people to plug in in other systems too. Uh, do you want me to roll through some of the other archetypes that are available in, in back channels we're trying to do there? Yeah, the next one I wanted to cover was the spy. Yeah. And the spy one, this one is definitely flexible for a number of systems. And Alex and I were debating, do we want the spy archetype to be in back channels or do we want it to be in backwoods where backwoods has a little bit more political intrigue and, uh, and elements to it and social uh, elements to it that we're trying to play up. And we ended up uh, deciding to put it in back channels. But in back channels, part of the flavor here is thinking about, well, there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of competition between merchants in the area. And along with this competition, uh, even so historically, there's a lot of spying going on. But this could also be things like, say you, are, so wardens are sort of like the roaming peace officers of this post-apocalyptic world. Maybe they're trying to infiltrate this pirate group, or maybe you are a pirate and, uh, and or you're part of a pirate crew, and you need to uh, infiltrate, you know, the the government or some or these merchants, etc. Uh, so the spy sort of fits into a lot of those settings. Spies uh, have lots of gadgets as one of their things, but then they have these social components, uh, the, the ability to um, and I think the, the gadgets is probably one of the cooler uh, cooler things that I have. So they can come with this camera kit or dual use um, sort of items that we're going to be playing mm -hmm. this core book. That's all I'm through. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. And the concept of spy is one is one that is going to be very bro very broad. But the next yeah. one is Storm Brewer. Yeah. So in every single one of our settings, we have uh, at least one magical archetype. And so, although our games, we leave it open, you know, if the game master want, wants to run them supernatural, heavy, or super light, we did want to include this element uh, of, of magic that has sort of begun to appear in this post-apocalyptic world. So we have the seer and backwater, and we have the spark lock, and uh, and back roads, which is somebody who do bring a little bit of their man. The storm brewer, again, trying to be flexible here, but a lot of what they do is interact with uh, with the weather. That can be really useful, especially if you're on a ship. You need to put some wind in your sails. The mm -hmm. so storm brewers are people who are able to use magic to manipulate the weather or the environment around. And I, and I was talking to a, a few, to some folks, some other game designers who are from, uh, from the, well, one of them from, uh, from the Carolinas in particular, and another person from uh, Florida and talking with them about just how important weather is in these areas, not just in, in nautical romance, but how much of it is a part of everyday life. Um, so much more than, it's so much more apparent than it might be in other parts of the, uh, of the U.S. and how they really love that Storm Brewer character and how they pull that part out of out of the setting uh, there too. So the Storm Brewer takes magic and applies it on that uh, to uh, brings it into the nautical romance uh, realm of things, but is very setting appropriate. Mm -hmm. So, so, and well, well. <laughs> You you already know that I'm you already know that I'm from the Twin Cities and the and there's always been the saying if you don't like the weather wait ten minutes. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, yeah, that's true. Midwest is a different you know 
different type of, of weather, weather though, you know, uh, and I, you know, cause I'm from the upper Midwest too, and we get a lot of temperature fluctuation and like that, but, you know, just the number of storms, like even I was in Florida at, uh, earlier this year in May mm-hmm. and, you know, and this is just a part of every life, beautiful weather, beautiful weather, lots of sunshine, sunshine state for a reason. And then, you know, if it's that time of year, oh, storm blowing in for an hour or two here, and then back to beautiful weather, beautiful weather, you know. Uh, and every, you know, every region has its things with uh, with, with the weather, too. Although I do think the southeast, uh, I do think it's sort of a unique a unique part that's sort of embedded in culture. Mm-hmm. But, you know, in the northeast, too, you get the, uh, you get big storms, you get nor'easters, stuff like that. So yeah, uh, wherever you go, there's something with weather. Uh, but yeah, the Midwest here, that, that is something I wish we played up a little bit more in terms of back roads, just because, uh, yeah, we also here in the mid have plenty of mm-hmm. and, weather culture. Well, it's a, it's a, diff, it's a different beast, but it's the reason why I always laugh when some, when somebody says that they want to, that they want to move southward to avoid the winter. And I'm, I'm like, You'd move southward to avoid the winter, and then you'd get and then you get a shitload of rain. So, did you really fix the problem, or did you just trade it with a new one? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, and then, well, in Minnesota, we also have these beautiful skies and that too. But I, you know, I grew up on a farm, so, uh, so where that saying is, you're talking about, unlike the weather, weight is especially relevant. But my dad, the storm brewers are also based in part on part of a joke in our family. But my dad, as a farmer, uh, during the summer, watches the weather religiously. Texts it on his phone, like, constantly. And he actually calls weathermen, weather meteorologists, as a joke, he calls them weather wizards. Uh, the idea that they can predict the weather and all that. But, you know, we'll start, like, seeing, okay, is there going to be rain today because I want the hay down? Uh when it's raining and stuff like that, you know, purpose dried out so they bail it up and don't want to bail it up when it's wet. Uh, many things from mold to spontaneous combustion and stuff. Uh, but so, you know, we're constantly watching uh, watching the weather. And so the, these storm brewers are, are, are weather with. Mm-hmm. So with that in, with that in mind, the fourth one, the fourth one from um, back channels I wanted to cover is the swashbuckler. How appropriate to cover it just a few um, days removed from International Talk Like a Pirate Day? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The swashbuckler is that that true sort of piratey character, and uh, one of the things you know, we have different types of fighters. So he, again, each setting sort of gets a one a bit more combat or. And in uh, back roads, we have the steadfast player and backwater. And here in, in back channel, um, we, we have the swashbuckler. But the difference with the swashbuckler is again, it's more about uh, it's more about their charisma. In many ways, they're not just a combatant; they're a performer. One of their abilities is called bravado, and it's all a, a little bit about showing off uh, and doing cool stuff. While you're in combat too, and I think it, it has a lot of role playing uh, potential. But the the swashbuckler is not just your everyday combatant. Uh, their charisma uh, plays a role in how they are fighting. Uh, and yeah, we've had a lot of fun with that, and we've already had again a couple of actual plays here where where folks get to really show off their swashbuckler, end up mm-hmm. sort of becoming part of the yeah. Uh, uh, especially in the combat scene. So I think it brings a little bit of cinematic flair to the combat. Mm-hmm. Uh, we love the swashbuckler. Yeah. And now when it comes to Backwoods, which you mentioned has a little bit more political intrigue than, than, than say, back channels, um, uh, the first one that I'd want to go into is the Scholar. Yeah. And so in Backwoods, we have uh, the scholar, and 
Scholar is, I think, you know, sort of comes from that Lovecraft uh, tradition of uh, horror in, and in New England. And uh, our scholar here is very knowledgeable on one. Uh, so they're very able to use certain types of skills, like lore skills. In other words, their knowledge of things. Mm hmm lore is one of those skills where you know you can if you're trying to find information to inform what you're doing or even to improve one of your skill roles you can, uh, a lore role to see hey, what do i know about it and the scholars have much more expansive knowledge really than any of those other characters so that's one of the things that they, i could do They're also better with language could be one of those other sort of uh, domains of knowledge and then the, the big one that's sort of being played up especially in the abilities in our quick start is the research role and scholars, we have them carrying around lots of books, sort of this book strap or book bag mm -hmm. uh, type item that allows them to carry multiple books at once. And uh, they're very good at, at researching and looking through those books. Whenever there's some type of knowledge, it's going to be a lot more accessible for the scholar in order to look up. And then we also added a fun ability to the quick start that we think sort of picking up on that uh, common trope in film which is the, uh, the, as they call it, pocket protect, protector trope in which you can use your books as a sort of defensive mechanism. So somebody shoots you and it looks like you've died. But in truth, you actually have that pocket Bible or something like that in your front pocket that ends up pretend, uh, protecting you even that damage. So there's a cool ability uh, based off of that trope for the scholar too. The scholar works with different types of domains of knowledge and those feed, will feed into some of their other they level up. Mm -hmm. So so next on the list would be the scold. Yeah, the scold is that, uh, so we have the storm brewer as a magic user in our uh, in back channels and Scold is a magic user that's all about charisma. And Scold, you might think of the term in terms of the history uh, around witches and things. Uh, a Scold being somebody with a with a sharp tongue, particularly a woman uh, historically. And we're trying to take that history and, and flip it around a little bit. And as our sort of example character that we create, we flip around on its head where it's actually this sort of Puritan preacher who has this form of witchery. And in this case, it's magic that's associated with um, with their charisma. And they have a bunch of cool things that they can do around it, but it's all about manipulating the social situation mm -hmm. or it could even be perform musical performances as well. So one of the abilities in the quick start is about their music. And then the other fun ability that we have in there, uh, besides just enhancing your charismatic abilities or performance abilities, uh, one of the abilities previewed in our quick start is called Bite Your Tongue. And it's the ability to make it so somebody cannot talk for a duration. And we'd have had a couple of actual plays already. We get to see that ability used in very cool ways. But in a setting that has a little bit more political interest, maybe a little more social dynamic or social uh, mechanics going on. Uh, this scold magic user has a uh, new sort of utility that a lot of our other magic users that we've had haven't been able to take advantage. Yeah. And I've always, I've always joked that the way pe that, um, the way people look at charisma in, ga in games is very, limited i guess is the right word to say cuz ever since i start ever since i started playing tabletop when i was a little kid there always seemed to be this idea this idea of what of what charisma is and it always it always centered around um looks even though like even though like the dm's guide in the fir in first edition um D &D, Outright, st outright stated that can be a factor, but it's not always the case. Yeah. But people still yeah, fall into no. that trap. Yeah. yeah in, in this instance, uh, and I think that's even through 5th edition, I, there's even been lots of conversation about that, or people believing 
that, oh, you know, charisma is a reflection of your looks and stuff rather than your persuasive ability. With the ways that our skills are delineated here, there are a few different ways that you can use your charisma uh, and that a school's abilities, and also a speech maker, which I can I'll describe here in a second, uh, their abilities can enhance. But you could, so there's one that's that performance ability, even though system is a little bit more associated with aptitude that the scold is able to bring their charisma into it uh, but the main ones are being uh, the ability to threaten and threatening can even be in an, uh, interact with our stress mechanic so you can actually cause people by, uh, by threatening sort of a different difference mm -hmm. yeah there's threaten uh persuade being a classic one and eve uh and these are similar to, to what you might find E. But those are some of the main ways that folks can use their charisma. And then, of course, to deceive other people in their appearance, too, using disguise. But again, it's more about that social interaction. Uh, I think that's our speech maker, too. The speech maker, so again, we sort of have these social characters one's a bit more magically oriented than the other and the other one's a bit more skill oriented sort of on that monkey, uh set of, of character types but focus especially on charisma and uh, that brings in a new uh, another element of social interaction in our games that social uh, sort of palm or platform of uh of tabletop games and for them, it's one of the things that it builds on is who you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, uh, based on a role that you can, which is related to your credit, some right in this game relates to your background, your social background. Um, you might have connections to other people, which can get you an in to a conversation or maybe helps you get into a exclusive location or helps you fit in with a with a certain crowd and things like that. so the the speech maker brings in that element too and then credit in the game is another thing that i just want to build on because that's another dimension to, to social interaction here uh with credit it also determines okay what sort of assets does your character have what sort of what is their clothing like because we want those things, uh, the GM, to be able to take those things into consideration if they want. It's just another piece in their toolbox where they can say, oh, yeah, you know, this is an area where you are sticking out like a sore thumb. Like, this is a really fancy motel. And your character, who's from, uh, from sort of this working class background, comes in here and you don't quite fit in unless you think ahead of time disguise yourself or buy some clothes etc the credit can be used to that extent as well um and the speech maker is able to capitalize on the credit more uh some of these other characters so i think it's a little bit more dynamic than other types mm -hmm. of social characters that you might get in other tabletop games just playing off of some of the different uh, the different mechanics or attributes that are built system character yeah. creation and Everybody, everybody can always use a good diplomancer, but it's one, it's a concept that a lot of people, um, never, I won't say never fully grasp, but definitely, um, it's easier, it's easier said than done. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the, the face and how people play the face. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the next one I, I was going to ask on is the Sentinel. Yeah, the Sentinel is sort of our other combat, uh, or is our combat character for for this one. And this uh, combat character is more about monster hunting and sort of uh, picking up on a lot of the, uh, or some other sort of New England Gothic style game that might have the uh, have monster hunters and uh, building off the history of vampire panics and witch panics in that area uh, in previous eras in the Northeast and. England in particular, the Sentinel is somebody who is more about tracking down these monsters, uh, being able to survive them and or hunt or kill them in some instances. But we also build in some options 
remember if this is in the start yet, where it might also be about protecting or preserving some of those monsters too. So there's a little new twist. In the last thing that I'll add is that one of the other things that's going to come up in some of their ability modules um, is, uh, is their connection with animal companions. So the sample character that we create for that quick start is a sentinel who has a scent hound. The scent hound is able to ha help them track down these monsters, uh, all that uh, sort of track things through the uh, through the creepy backwoods of of New England, and they'll have some special abilities along those lines. Too. Yeah, this might be a bit of a stretch, but the first thing that came to mind was the film Brotherhood of the Wolf. I haven't seen that one, actually. Uh, is that one set in New England, or is it more about monster hunting in general, or what? Um, uh, I'd say I'd say it's more of the more of the latter. Um, especially especially since it is it is a bit more of a mystery. It's it um it is ta it's more t it's more taking place in fr in France, but it is in, it is in a similar um, ballpark. Yeah. Well, that mystery element is something that we're trying to build up with some of these characters too. So political intrigue being one of the play styles that we're hoping comes up in backwoods here, and then mysteries. Mm -hmm. And mysteries are, are common elements in horror fiction too, but uh, but it, investigation style game, such as uh, plenty of what you see in. And Call of Cthulhu and uh, and all that, where you know, and we're thinking about our scholar character here too, but requires a little bit of uh, of other types of legwork, which we've always built into our games. There's always been libraries and the ability to do research, uh, and we've always had investigation as part of it. That's something we're trying to build up with some of these characters. And the Sentinel isn't just a fighter; you know, it's somebody who, uh, who as their abilities develop, are also trackers and. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, picking up on that same mystery that you're talking. Yeah, and I'm, I'm I am va I am vastly simplifying the ma the matter because since you haven't seen Brotherhood of the Wolf, which I do recommend, I do f I do feel that it would be within your particular wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, it's just it's just that I don't want to do any spoilers. Yeah, I do. Especially for somebody watching the stream and or for me when I finally get to watch it too. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll check it out though. Yeah, and I mean I, I was I was tempted to also bring up Solomon Kane, but the only thing but the only connective tissue there is Kane being a Puritan. Yeah. I think Sol Solomon Kane uh Kane and uh the uh gosh, I'm blanking. what's the Conan authors? Um Robert E. Howard. Yeah, Robert E. Howard. Yeah, I think that those stories are definitely uh, relevant here, and I uh, we have a couple adventures that even had a, with Solomon Kane in, uh, in particular, but our Robert E. Howard uh, inspired adventures because he has a few that actually uh, take place on the New England coast, which are uh, which are which, pretty great stories. Yeah, which ma great. which makes sense because he. He was fr he was friends with um, Lovecraft, and the two the two of them the two of them do have one collaboration together. Although I I'd imagine that I'd imagine that their friendships w may have been tied to a mutual hatred of um, Hugo Gernsback. Because I, I don't know too much about. Uh, um, uh, Hugo I was just going to mention you know Alex and I both have read a lot of Robert E. Howard, but Alex. Loves the Conan's things mm -hmm. too. So, and he's he also turned me on to one of Robert E. Howard's shorts, uh, yeah. which is more on the Southern Gothic, because Robert E. Howard definitely explored some American original Gothic fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, Pigeons from, right? I think that's Robert E. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the Hugo Gernsback is the is where the Hugo Award comes from, and. Lovecraft had call, had called him Hugo the Rat. Wow. Uh, so I, 
as far as far as why it's it's not explicitly known, it's speculated that it's because it's because um, unsurprisingly he got he feels he got screwed over over money. Which, given the given the state of things with pulp, with pulp authors, I could I could honestly see that. No, it was one of those. It was one of those carny businesses where, how where how you got paid was sometimes literally a dice roll. Yeah, but uh, but it's not even just with pulp authors. Like uh, I know we're gonna topic, but I think of authors like Kurt Vonnegut who made a lot of his money pretty early on. I also made, but uh, publishing pretty much wherever good for any of his. Uh, short stories and magazines and stuff from uh, dirty magazines to whatever he could get and just the wild variation in but uh mm-hmm. but the fi- the final one from backwoods that I wanted to dip into is the speech maker yeah and I spoke to the speech maker a little bit uh, already, but uh, yeah, just to expand on that too. They're another social character, uh, but playing on different elements. So, whereas the school does like magical enhancement and things, the speech maker is able to use other parts that are the attributes that are created in the character creation system, in addition to uh, the sort of having a diversity of skills. But one of those abilities that we have is six degrees of separation. Six degrees of Kevin Bacon for our game where I, it's about your credit and you make this roll and you're trying to roll under your credit and if you succeed you can find this connection with the character through somebody else that you might know as a way to get an in. Then the other one is uh, each makers uh, whatever their line of work might be a politician one of the abilities is called hardened heart and it's a, a way of uh, reducing that stress mechanic and the effects of the stress mechanic. Uh, so again, very flexible here, but say you end up seeing a monster or you're able to suppress some of your fear in that situation. Another really useful uh, ability here too. Mm-hmm. Speech makers, uh, yeah, get to pull on different attributes. They are able to, they're sort of the, uh, have a variety of skills in the system too, um, and preserve face in the, uh, when confronted with some Monsters are supernatural. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and of course, of course, be of course beyond that, there is the there 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 are the other pillars like I like ideals the sk- the skill system, um, which I always I always prefer the skills I always have a preference for the side of skill system that you're doing here where it isn't just um, throwing people into the woods and saying, or, th- or throwing people into the water and saying, swim, damn it. Yeah. Uh, I, I have, I have historically been harsh with skill systems, but that's, that's a, that's a product of experience with, um, a lot of, a lot of those games back in the nineties that had skill lists that were downright offensive. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of the challenges with creating a system that uh, that has many skills or sort of a skill-based system. And and for us, that's part of the survival or elements too. It's uh, we like a larger skill list, mm-hmm. but we want those skills to be useful uh, and, and defined, intuitive, too, right? And I think that as as you're sort of indicating here, there are many of them where it's like these skills are like, uh, what do I even do? Like even no, I love the game Call of Cthulhu. It's uh, one of Alex's and my favorite games ways that we connected when we first met many years ago. But those, uh, some of those skills, I'm even still puzzled with today, even though I've played it so, uh, so many times. But we did a lot of refining and play testing for first creating Backwater, just trying to make sure that all the skills that we have are relatively intuitive and or ones that might seem a little more context specific we try to broaden those or give a little bit of guidance of other ways that they might be able to do if we still be, view them as being as 
Um, so we've done a lot of work with our, our skill system, hopefully make it a bit more uh, a bit more intuitive. Uh, but again, we, we see it as being crucial for sort of a survival horror uh, system, or at least what we're going for here, because we want to make characters uh, a little more dependent on their teams. Uh, you know, human characters, they're not only fragile, they should, should not only be fragile, but uh, and they should, they should be good at things. Humans are, but not good at everything, and uh, and need to rely on on their crew members and other players. And through, and that skill based system allows for that. Yeah, for me, it's for me, it's just a matter of making sure that you don't have a bunch of skills that are that are quote unquote realistic, but have but um have very very situational use. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and that's sort of, sort of one of the things I was trying to speak to in there too. But uh, so stunt is a good example of one of our skills that we worked and reworked multiple times before creating backwater. And stunt, stunt is sort of this general athletic thing, but we didn't want to have an ability just for climbing. Like who wants to put all of their abilities into climbing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Or an ability just for swim or, or something like that. Uh, or an ability just for jumping. Yeah, that Why kind of not? thing is only get, is only going to work if you're do if you, if you're relying on the assumption that you're going to be doing a whole lot of jumping and not a whole lot else. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, okay, maybe you created a character as a world champ long jumper. Yeah, max out that jumping. Uh, but uh, in this instance, we created stunt and try to make it really useful in different ways. So stunt. <laughs> Uh, not only can you use it for like if you so like you don't need to make a skill check for just climbing basic either we want to input but if you need to climb something and there's something that's adding difficulty to you need to climb really fast you need to climb and uh, and it's wet or uh, you need to climb but there aren't many good footholds you know something that's actually challenging okay make this stunt roll in order to do it and you can also make a stunt roll for swimming in those difficult situations um, you can, yeah, and you can do it for jumping, etc. But we also try to make stunt more useful again, and we provide all this guidance in the book. There, you can choose to read it or ignore it, but you have this in your toolbox. But stunts can also be used as sort of combat maneuvers for shoving people, tripping people, disarming them, uh, those sorts of things. Uh, so that's an example of a skill where we're like, okay, normally. When we've seen these in other systems, they can be a little too context dependent. We want to take that and we want to make it more useful so that characters do not feel like they're wasting their skill point there when, when they're leveling up or creating their character if they put it in there. So now you can have a long jumper who can use their athleticism uh, in other ways uh, uh, than, than they would in maybe some of the... Not to poo on any of those other systems, which obviously have their own merit too. That's one of the things that we are trying to do differently in our game. Mm -hmm. Now, what would what would you be shooting for as far as the page count for backwoods and back channels? Yeah, we're going for a two hundred and fifty, and uh, we, which is always it's just sort of our, our all of our goals since backroads. Uh, the issue with the, we had backroads had so idea and alex and i originally wrote a draft that was over three pages i, I we were talking about that at one point in time and i said we need to get it down to 250 and alex is like i don't know we've got some great stuff in here i'm like we gotta get that uh so we ended up doing that but our goal all along is 150 um i i will say that down the line one day we might create some more abbreviated versions of our books more affordable that you know uh, if you're just a player not a game master some sort of what people. sort of like what cipher system does yeah a little bit in this case it'd be sort of taking okay here's the character creation here's your knowledge uh, stuff and then are and then here are some of the necessary or essential rules uh, sort of thing so cutting the books in half uh, basically it'd be more like 120 pages and and we would do that in the future uh we're thinking about but uh in this instance we really want to make sure that we have all those materials that gms and folks can 
they can adapt and we definitely need to include monster mm-hmm. funding in this book so we're starting with our with our big book first and that's 150 pages uh down the line uh, if we're able to fund which we're very close to fund at this point in time. if you are watching this and you've been on the fence please uh please pledge you yours could be pushes us over the edge because we're about 80 percent here um so getting closer and by the time it's releasing a little bit further down the line um but just yeah we uh we wanted a little bit bigger of a book so this one's 250 uh pages it's more of a not just for players but it's also a toolbox uh that pick up and uh, and run with too uh and our goal is always to keep around 250. Back roads still had some of that creep. We ended up at, at 275 for mm-hmm. back roads. Or it's actually 277. Uh, if you count some of the extra pages that necessarily need to go in there. But uh, we're keeping it around 250 for backwoods and back channel. Uh, and I don't think we're going to have as much of a creep issue for these books than we did for the, for the pre. Yeah, it's the... Well, I, I can't... We want to have the materials, but we don't have, want to have too much. Like we aren't looking for a three hundred page book, basically, uh, and uh, so we want to have all the all the toolbox stuff. We just don't want to go too far. So two fifty is our is our limit, and that's about already with the, most of the materials that we have. That's what we're looking because we're pretty wrapping up a lot of it. Well, back rows was only two seventy nine, so. Yeah, or, yeah, back rows. Yeah, two seventy nine. Is that what it was? And then, and back water was the smallest. That one's about two hundred, two ten. Two ten could be a little bit more than that. But these ones are going to fall in that middle. What feels like the sweet spot around two three hundred always just feels like a little too much. The books get a little bit unwieldy, and I feel like it's a little too easy to get lost in them. Two fifty. Try to keep them as organized as possible. Feels a little bit more manageable for us. A little big for many of the books nowadays. Mm-hmm. Many of them now are much smaller in size and uh, and like in like their actual uh, physical dimensions, but also in in page count nowadays too. So we're we're doing something. It's sort of a diff. It's a little bit harder, less sustainable of a, of a model to end up kickstarting because everything is a little bit more expensive. And we acknowledge that uh, too, but it's uh, it's what we're looking for for now. Um, future, we might switch things up a little bit and and uh, find more more affordable ways, simplified ways for those who aren't looking to GM at, uh, these games at their own table, just looking to play and have a copy on their bookshelf. Mm-hmm. Well, I will I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how how both books um, pan, pan out and the inevitable arguments about page, about page count that that will follow. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. Because ev- every pair, every pairing has somebody being the Abbot and somebody being the Costello. Yeah, yeah, and me and Alex, as you've already heard, <laughs> uh, Alex is a fount of inspiration, and I'm the and I'm the the naysayer who <laughs> who pairs things down and in a bit. But Alex's mm-hmm. creativity is also magic ingredient i think for, for well we both are our magic ingredients in our our own rights but uh, uh i always think that alex has uh sort of shakespeare and imagination to me uh boundless mm-hmm. but with that said i do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here and anytime you see fit to return, whether whether it's the further development of the backbone engine or or future regions with it within this um uh, this American Gothic, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Well, thanks again for having us on, and you know we'll be back. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so long as we fund here, we probably got another project in our back pocket. Mm-hmm. So. Look- 
And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!